if you don't keep up with it, four of them have gone gold. Uh, Charlie Daniels, Vern Gosden, Ricky Van Schoten. Heiko is a former government official, now a top executive at Sony. Back home, he'd probably never find himself this cozy with a total stranger, but here, his Japanese politeness has him trapped. Coming Tuesday. This coming Tuesday, I hope you're there. Um, unfortunately, I'm going to Atlanta. <laughs> I'm sorry. Heiko may be a little embarrassed by this encounter, but he's not surprised. Having spent years in the States, he understands the cultural divide. I think always that the American society is verbally explicit society. Explicit? Yes, explicit society. Verbally. But uh, Japanese society is very implicit. One of the uh, main characteristics of the uh, Japanese culture, art, literature, uh, anything. Uh, the uh, role of vacuum is very important. The role of the vacuum, of the, vacuum, of the space, yes, the silence. Yes. yes. <laughs> Well, there's nothing implicit about the grand old Opry. And in other ways, too, American society seems to declare itself all too publicly to the Japanese. Uh, when I arrived at Kennedy Airport, first, I was a little bit shocked at the shabby status of airport. And again, while we were on the way to the hotel, I saw, again, the roads were terrible and uh, there are so many rubbish thrown away on the slope. And I thought uh, the American economy or American culture itself might be at least uh, on the verge of decaying in certain area. In the eyes of many Japanese, it's not just our infrastructure that's crumbling. Professor Yoshi Tsurumi came here from Japan in the 1960s and now teaches at the City University of New York. He says that despite our military successes, the Japanese worry about an America in economic decline. Problems are here visible. It doesn't have to be Japanese to recognize them. But the lack of will on the part of American leadership, industrial and political leaders, uh, to really deal with them, even recognize them as problems, that scares many Japanese. And the young, younger generation simply picks, pick up on that, that theme and say Americans are totally now crumbling uh, American days are over. Ten years ago, when U.S. auto workers crashed this Toyota, Japanese TV ran the footage again and again. To the Japanese, a sign that the U.S. was scapegoating them for America's decline. The image lives on in a recent Japanese economics primer called Japan Inc. The U.S. auto industry is represented by thinly disguised Kreisky Motors, management by Kreisky's CEO, Lee Ironcoke. Both are treated with contempt. Harvard Business School professor Mike Yoshino is a native Japanese in whom his countrymen confide. He hears the scorn firsthand. It's not the words, the expressions uh, they use, but it's, uh, it's a disdain, uh, almost a despise, a contempt. Uh, Americans don't work hard. Ameri all Americans uh, really uh, have a serious drug problems, and Americans are poorly educated. And Americans are not disciplined. Business consultant Sheridan Tatsuno is a third-generation American with extensive Japanese contacts. The Japanese are so puzzled, and, and somewhat they feel sorry for us. Um, they, they keep asking me, what's the matter with America? Why can't you get your act together? According to James Fallows, a prominent analyst of modern-day Japan, these new negative feelings are tinged with an old fear. I think we can understand it in the way that as children we might look on the schoolyard bully at school, somebody who internally was worse than us, but also was bigger than us. And we were vulnerable to him in a certain way that he could wallop us in the side of the head at any given time. And I think there's something of that combination of, of attitudes. The Japanese feel, with some reason, that they've just outperformed and outtried and outworked and outsacrificed the U.S. At the same time, the U.S. is big, and they've gotten into trouble by challenging the U.S. before. So I think there is that, that ambiguity as you would have towards the big bully. Whatever mixed feelings the Japanese may have about the U.S., for now at least, they keep coming. To sell products here, to buy businesses, to invest, as in this Nissan automobile plant in Smyrna, Tennessee. In 1981, this factory opened under protest. 
as local Teamsters opposed the use of non-union labor. Officials tried to carry on, but they were constantly met with chants of Go Home Jack, Remember Pearl Harbor, and Go Home Rat. Representing his government, there's Jiro Aiko, right in the thick of it. How did it make you feel? Uh, well, uh, I felt, oh, this is an American society. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? Very competitive. <laughs> and very angry. Were you scared at all? No, I, I enjoyed it. Aiko <laughs> enjoyed the energy, the freedom, the Americanness of what he saw because it harkened back to a vision of America that many Japanese still admire. This Japanese Jack Daniels ad is trading on the positive stereotype of Tennessee, home to traditional American values like individuality and openness. Thus, Japan's double image. America, land of the free. America, land of the homeless. This split view of Americans in particular, and outsiders in general, has a long history in the land of the rising sun. As the Japanese have compared themselves to the rest of the world, a sense of superiority seems to have consistently alternated with what at times has seemed like a national inferiority complex. Because historically, the Japanese, like other isolated peoples, have seen themselves as a race apart. In the mid-1800s, when Commodore Perry's gunboats pried open Japan, the double image was striking. To some, the agent of a more advanced culture. To others, a big-nosed barbarian. For the next half century, the positive and negative images coexisted. Japan studied and imitated the West, acting as if Western ways were superior to their own. But, says one expert, At the same time that the Japanese were playing jazz and dancing in the cabarets, they were also reacting to the Immigration Act that excluded Japanese from the United States so that the image was good American, bad American, side by side in the minds of the Japanese. But those images did not cause Pearl Harbor. It was real history that caused Pearl Harbor. Japan scholar and historian Carol Gluck makes a somewhat subtle point here, that it wasn't just our images of each other that led to war in the Pacific, but actual historical events. The Depression, Nazi aggression, Japanese aggression in China. But once Pearl Harbor occurred and the two countries were at war, those negative images and stereotypes were ready for each country to use against one another. As Professor John Dower has shown in the book War Without Mercy, Westerners were now foreign devils. Winston Churchill had horns. The man behind the mask, FDR, was a demon. As the war was ending and Japan braced for invasion, Yoshi Tsurumi's teacher talked to the kids about what to do when the American cannibals came ashore. Not only we talked about it, we practiced. Hoping just we wouldn't have to do that, but the, uh, <laughs> that, you know, just the choice was either you were eaten alive by Americans or, or, or commit yourself to suicide and die honorably. You, you practiced it? Of course we practiced it. How did you practice well, it? Well, we didn't have a weapons or anything, so we were taught a you know, few things. Hanging yourself is the easiest of things, or jumping off the cliffs, you know, kind of low tech kind of suicidal methods we <laughs> ready available to any, any, any human being. When the Japanese finally met Americans in the flesh, however, they found themselves looking up to the friendly and generous outsiders. And they are so tall, and uh, uh, they look so rich, and uh, we know that we were defeated by the United States, so we look at them with a kind of awe. Any Japanese older than my age, that means mid-50s and above, do remember this the tremendous changeover uh, that took place in each individual's mind, from just Americans as ogre to Americans as a benign and very understanding the, just, just the uh, uh, leader. Uh, and, and that feeling, and that, that impression is very, very strongly surviving even till today. However, the younger generation, younger than, say, 40, who grew up after World War II, don't remember those, what happened during World War II. It wasn't taught, etc. And certainly, just as they grew into the prosperity uh, of, of Japanese uh, war, uh, post-war economy, then they begin to develop somewhat negative perception about the United States. Now, more importantly, those younger generations are now coming into the position of leadership in industry, academia, and government. The tremendous generational changeover is taking place in, in, in Japan. 
and the new leadership doesn't remember Pearl Harbor or American generosity. Meanwhile, the older generation is still trying to buy our goodwill or simply become good corporate American citizens. We're back on tour with our Japanese executives. Last stop is New York's Japan Society, where they're listening to appeals for funding. In many respects, blacks in America have tremendous pride in your success, even though they're Americans. 30 million black people might become much more productive once you realize that we're not <laughs> stupid. In a poll last year, nearly half the Japanese people ranked minorities as America's number one economic problem. And some observers think Japanese racial prejudice is so deep-seated, it extends well beyond African Americans. I think the only way a white American can have a sense of what it's like to be a black is to live in Japan for a while. Because it's the only place on earth, I think, where your racial identity is so important in a thousand summary judgments each day and is on the whole negative. That, you know, I've lived in Africa and there I was obviously different from everybody else, but it was, diff it was somehow on a different plane in Japan where I could never, ever escape the way I looked. Just picture blonde, six-foot Jim Fallows in this typical Tokyo crowd. It's no surprise that such a homogeneous society treats the rest of us as outsiders. But in the United States, a nation of immigrants, we have to make a serious effort to get along with neighbors very different from ourselves. So finally, as a sort of experiment, I put perhaps the ultimate American question to a very worldly wise Japanese. I want you to react to me as a person. I want you to try harder to, to like me. W w would you try harder? Or is it an unfair demand? Uh, ha, 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 ha. Well, uh, this is not my personal answer. But uh, I'm, I'm going to tell you what the, uh, uh, you know, normal reaction of, the, of Japanese to your question. Um, I know that I cannot comply with your request. But still, I want to be very polite to you, and uh, I don't want to disappoint you. So you're saying that Americans want something from the relationship that Japanese just can't give? If we remain as we are. If they remain as they are. Well, in a sense, they can't in a multinational, multilateral world. But change in the Japanese character has tended to be a rather slow and uncertain thing. As long as Japanese see themselves as deeply different, they'll probably see Americans as somewhat curious creatures for whom stereotypes are the easiest categories to apply. And if U.S. society remains as it has been in recent years, then the Japanese stereotype of us is likely to become even worse than it already is.